This oral history of museum computing is provided by Rob Lansfield and was recorded on the 21st of May, 2021 by Paul Marty and Kathy Jones. Here we go. Uh, before joining the museum world, uh, I was actually a professional musician for about 10 years. Um, I think Paul knows this. Um, and um, along with a lot of performance and some composing, I was also supporting myself doing various kinds of self-employed self work that almost all lived in this overlapping area between the arts uh, in some form and technologies in some form, mostly analog ones back then. Uh, this was the 80s for the most part, uh, between uh, music typesetting, audio recording, photography, um, all these things that are in that sort of overlapping space. Um, and it actually all sort of amounted to, to the gig economy before it was called the gig economy. Um, after that, I jumped back into, well, jumped into grad school. And this was at Wesleyan. Uh, and I thought it was going to be just two years of reading the same books as a cohort of people were reading the same books and talking about them and then going back to being a musician and doing all of this freelance stuff. Uh, but partway through that graduate time, I was... Um, kind of informally recruited by the person who became my boss to apply for a museum job. Uh, this was as registrar of the Davison Art Center collection, uh, which is was also right at Wesleyan, um, next door to the music department where I was spending so much time. So I agonized over whether I could make a two-year commitment to the job, which now strikes me as like borderline <laughs> amusing slash hilarious because obviously that was a long time ago and I haven't left the sector yet. Um, so I took the plunge uh, and before I knew it, the museum sector had actually become my main professional home uh, for now almost 30 years. Um, so I mentioned I was hired in as a registrar. Uh, this is, I guess, because I can sometimes be good at organizing things and I already had this pretty serious interest in photographs and this is largely a collection of works on paper, including photographs. Um, but about a year after I started the job, I attended MCN 1995 at the Coronado in San Diego. And um, yay, it was awesome. Um, and I, this, this was in large part because even in the course of my first year as a registrar, and I say this with, with genuine great respect for registrars who are awesome at what they do, um, uh, but I knew that it wasn't really a line of work that I would personally find engaging for more than a couple of years. Uh, I was feeling like I really like working in a museum. Uh, the things that would um, engage me more would be thinking about how to make use of new technologies that pop up in relation to this really cool collection and the ways that people can, can use it and learn from it and uh, enjoy it. Um, so at MCN 1995, a good number of the presentations were uh, showing off and talking about um, museum websites, this new thing, this fairly new thing, um, and how they were made and all of this. So that seemed pretty interesting. And um, I got back from MCN, got a big fat book on HTML 2.0. It's amazing thinking back like how fat a book could be published about HTML 2.0, which was not all that very extensive a standard, but oh my gosh, this was a fat book on HTML 2.0. And um, played around in my favorite text editing software, BB Edit for, for, for the Mac users out there. Um, and a, a pretty early version of Photoshop, I don't remember, three, four, something like that. Um, learned a little bit about Apache and launched our museum website early in 96. Uh, pretty minimal, but it was fun to do. And suddenly we didn't have to put ink on paper to let people know like <laughs> when the gallery would be open, right? The, the brochure wear days, uh, such as they were. Uh, but I, as I alluded to a second ago, it was already becoming clear to me at that point that the area of museum work that I found uh, most engaging and most likely to, to keep me engaged over a good long time uh, was using pe technologies to um, enable people to get to digital content and, and have experiences with that content that they would find useful or enjoyable somehow. Um, and that really turned out to be a defining thread through a lot of my work ever since, um, <laughs> along with the many other things that need doing. Of course, it's, it's not all that. But um, so then, where are we? Mid 90s and the late 90s, um, 
when I started the job as registrar, um, collections data was managed um, in two parallel ways, a, a physical card catalog, uh, one card per print or, or photograph generally, um, and HyperCard. Anybody remember HyperCard? HyperCard was awesome for what it was. It was not really a collections information management system platform, but you know, it could be made to do all sorts of things. And um, the person before the person before the person and the job before me, there'd been some quick turnover there, um, had built this cool little HyperCard stack that was at least a, a, a solid little place to, to start having untold legions of student interns keyboarding in typed content off of, at that point, I guess it would have been about 40 years worth of catalog cards. Um, so HyperCard, yeah, um, good place to sort of stage some content before it lands in the system that can do a little bit more and be like robustly multi-user and all the rest. So I, back then, uh, was knowing that we were a very small shop, um, the, the DAC uh, still still is, uh, there were just three staff people, one of whom was a half-time preparator installer, uh, the curator who was de facto director, uh, and the role that I was in, which at that point was called Registrar of Collections that soon after acquired a second uh, title to reflect the uh, more technical work. Uh, but it was a you know tiny little shop and there proved to be um, no way that we could figure out uh, to make the case for the kind of actual, you know, <laughs> recurring annual cash budget um, allocation that it would have taken to um, license and keep maintenance and support running for a vendor developed and supplied collection system. Um, that was always my first choice in principle because it is a lot more robust across uh, prospective tra staff transitions, uh, especially when there are only three people who work there. Um, and and no one of those positions was really solely focused on the kind of work that would allow an in-house system to be kept running. That said, um, it seemed like, okay, you know, what do we do here? And this goes to the theme of invisibility, I should say, um, is that it At a point, it seemed that, okay, we need a more robust system. The one way that we can make that happen, at least for the foreseeable future on a scale of some years is to um, develop in-house. Um, so in ways that I designed to be as <laughs> minimally dependent on me being there uh, eternally, um, ended up actually using the, the sometimes loved and sometimes maligned uh, FileMaker Pro uh, as, um, for the record, not a platform to build a terribly architected system, but a platform to actually use as a legit rapid application development environment and a robust client server platform with a lot of stuff way locked down and modeled for data integrity and all of that good stuff. Um, and um, did it, rolled it out. Um, it made sense. It worked for a long time, kept us running for about 10 years. Um, up until um, it became possible to um, make a case to the university, which is the DAC's parent institution, uh, for actual, uh, an ongoing commitment for the funding it would take to um, migrate to a uh, externally developed and supported system, which you know, always in concept was the model that made sense, uh, but was not the model that could actually be implemented for some time uh, in, until it could be. Um, and this, this really goes to invisibility, right? Because the cost of licensing a system, a CMS, um, that was very visible. The costs of staff time to develop in-house because there happened to be somebody working there who was really interested in doing it and had thought some about data modeling in other contexts before museum work and was getting paid to be there anyway, um, that was effectively invisible. So it looked like, wow, cool. You know, so all, all, all those people at the Davis and Art Center have to do is like, pay 159 bucks for a FileMaker Pro license. And then once this thing is built after a year or two, um, figure out in their budget how to pay about a thousand a year for, for server and client licenses, 
um, for this rather more generic, far lower cost thing that has no specific support for an application that's developed on top of it. Um, it looked cheap. Um, and in a cash sense, it was. Um, it actually worked out fine because it did bridge that time until we could, could uh, move off in-house. But um, the reason it played out that way really was because technology work in the museum was invisible in certain ways. So it looked like things that would require that as a chief resource uh, looked like they were close to free. Um, although, of course, it was zero sum with other work that could have been done and, and, and all of that. Um, so just an interesting aspect of invisibility, I think. Um, after about those, after that 10 years or so, uh, we were able to migrate out. By then, one of the nice things about being an in-house system was that, that for data cleanup um, and reconciliation, I could build all sorts of custom stuff into it that I came to take for granted the ability to do that. It was interesting. Once we were in a, in a, a vendor developed system, it was like, wait, I can't like set up calc fields and do this and truncate and, and rewrite to a different field and whatever else. And <laughs> you're like, no, why would you be able to do that? And I was like, oh, never mind. I'm just going to go like shed a tear and figure out a, another way to do what I want to do. Uh, but it was, it was interesting. Uh, and uh, it, they're, st they're still running in that system too. So, so that ended up working out. Uh, and now there is outside support for continuity across staff transitions. So big sigh of relief. And uh, Kathy. Um, which system did replace the one that you got, that you made? Ah, uh, that was Embark. Oh, Embark. Still yeah. they're using Embark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, which, I mean, you know, every system has its upsides and downsides. There were certainly, <laughs> now here's some stuff that I might like massage the language around once I'm seeing the transcript, but um, there are, as with any CMS, uh, there are aspects of Embark that drove me completely crazy. Um, I think in any CMS, there would be some things that would drive me crazy. Um, in Embark, there were also lots of things that, that I really, really liked. Uh, there were some things, uh, especially since uh, the, well, there, there were things using leveraging web kiosk as a web collection search platform, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. Um, there were hoops I was able to sort of cajole it into to jumping through that, that were really sort of fun and convenient. And so there were some nice things there, but yeah. Um, monolithic data file, whatever. There, is, there are some things that I'm not so crazy about, but incremental updates to the web, nope, one big whole big thing. Uh, but, you know, trade-offs, life is full of them. <laughs> I made the face because the Peabody had Embark and moved to TMS. And so mm. in any, C, uh, any collections management system, you have to be careful what you wish for. <laughs> sure enough. And, and I've, I've migrated myself uh, from um, Davis and Art Center in-house system to Embark at Davis and Art Center and now to TMS at Yale Center for British Art. And on the one hand, there are lots of great things TMS can do. Um, on the other hand, there are definitely things I miss from Embark that TMS cannot do. And, and you know, since I'd not been uh, so closely involved with TMS before, um, and you know, I've just known lots of people who, who have worked with it over the years uh, until I moved. Um, there, yeah, there are certainly things that I found surprising, like, wait, what, we can't do that? But then there's a ton, ton of other stuff that, that we can do because um, you can, of course, do all sorts of raw SQL stuff under the hood. Um, and I was just going to jump in and say that I appreciate you highlighting both aspects of the problem there, because there's two kinds of invisibility there. So one, you've got the invisible work of the people who are already working in the museum. And why should we buy an expensive new system when they can just keep that old one working and it doesn't cost us any anything, right? Yeah. And then you've got the invisible work of when you move to a new system and suddenly things don't work the way it used to and you have all kinds of unanticipated challenges and that adds a lot of work onto the, the other side that, that people aren't seeing either. Yeah, yeah, and as is um, sort of common coin in our, in our professional world, um, even though CMS is strictly speaking nowadays, aside from a few really terrible long ago legacy ones, in a strict technical sense, they don't really have lock-in but in a practical operational costs of switching due to staff time and other factors, 
they have immense costs of switching. So I think they, they still tend, e even though vendors, at least in all of the cases that I know much about, have really done the right thing and, and made it perfectly feasible to extract everything and put it into some new environment. Um, it's not that there's like no way to export the data. I've heard tales of that in certain systems that I won't mention because it's all hearsay. Um, I think we know what some of them might be. But um, you know, e even with that, even without a technical roadblock to it, um, oh my God, I mean, the switching costs, you know, it's, it's for any museum, regardless of whether they have three staff or a hundred staff or hundreds of staff, um, relative to the scale of the staff that they have, um, how is a CMS migration anything less than like uh, everything else kind of goes on hold for two or three years? That is especially collections data related, right? I mean, and, and that's if everything goes well. <laughs> well, no, I'm exaggerating. Two or well, three years, in, uh, including a little contingency time. But. Just a quick question here, right? Yeah. Because if you went from the paper-based card catalog, so as you said, you also had a hypercard to a FileMaker Pro system, then yeah. from a FileMaker Pro system to Embark, how would you yes. compare and contrast those two migrations? Yeah, interesting. Um, well, so I, I was never happily, basically all of the paper card content had been keyed in before I came on. Um, so it was pretty much all in HyperCard except for, you know, error correction, we'd better check the card because this is seems to be a typo kind of stuff. Um, so in as far as my migration planning and execution moments, it was HyperCard to in-house and then in-house to Embark. Um, HyperCard to in-house was, was um, Simpler in one way and more complex in one way. Simpler because um, the field set uh, was significantly smaller at that point. It was, gosh, I don't recall exactly, but I would guess there were probably like 30 to 40 fields in the HyperCard stack. Um, but the content in those fields, since it was like fresh keyboarded in by, by students who I'm not meaning to disrespect here, they did like tons and tons of work that that they did diligently and could not have been done any other way. But th since the data that was being keyboarded in came off catalog cards that had been produced in a time when there was a very, very high level of presumed expertise on the part of anybody who would ever actually have access to look at the catalog cards. So th those cards, as were many in many museums, were full of the world's most cryptic and often ambiguous abbreviations that like a print curator would totally know what this thing means, but other people might not, you know, B period 67, you know, is it Barch? Is it one of like six different catalog raisonne that also were written by somebody whose name begins with B and a curator knows that it's not Barch because it's a 20th century print, so it couldn't possibly be Barch. Um, all of these things that, so, really, really, um, let me say much appreciated data content, but really, really not yet cleaned up data content. So tr some tricky stuff around there, um, also in regard to what fields content had been entered into um, and what, it, what that meant implicitly. Um, and also, and in that first migration, as I was running test migrations, I was also still, um, building and doing sort of iterative tuning of design of the FileMaker based system uh, based on how that content actually lived there, based on things in user interface that I would realize, oh gosh, I know people are gonna want to be able to do this. Um, and so it, there was a fair amount of sort of recursive, um, you know, how much of this does it make sense to make <laughs> a very large number of systematic cleaning passes through the data in HyperCard, how much does it make sense to do that externally to both systems uh, in you know, big tab files or whatever? Um, and how much of it does it make sense to tactically hold off on until it's in the new system where I know I could, could craft certain other kinds of automated things? And the, the affordances for running cleanup, um, either in automated ways or in ways that can be optimized for visual display and like human mind ear, my, sorry, mind eye recognition. Um, uh, so the, the, that, that, was a, that was a pretty idi idiosyncratic process that 
that kind of recursively folded together data cleanup, data migration, system tuning in the new system, um, and all of that. The, the second migration for me out of the in-house system and into Embark, um, that was, among other things, it was starting with a significantly cleaner set of data content. There was still big uh, chunks of that that I knew still needed a whole lot of normalization, but, but I knew what they were by that point, uh, and they could be effectively migrated as um, not as clean as I knew I wanted them to be, but I knew that there'd be no tripwires there for things going awry actually during migration. Um, and that that was somewhat quicker too, because because the system was fully built that it was moving into. There wasn't this like combined effort to to figure out what the system should really look like for its first production version uh, while also like getting the data into it. Um, so that was a little bit more of a sort of a typical like, you know, see, do a test migration first and see how a small number of complete records land and, and what wants to be remapped and what wants to be, what needs to be concatenated before it can go in if it was more granular in the source system, what needs to be split out because it naturally wants to live in a more granular way in the new system, what wants to stay stuck together in a less granular way in the new system, even though it could be broken out, because if it gets broken out in the new system, then it all has to be inevitably reconcatenated for every single foreseeable display use off the new system, um, even though it can be, and here like dimensions, right? They're sort of a classic case of this. Um, they had, because especially in a print collection, they're often full of things like, you know, plate 147 millimeters in parens, irregular at left edge, or, you know, by all, with all of these weird attributes and qualifiers and hedges and, and clarifications. And so there were things like that for it, for, for, for that migration, it made sense to, I um, can't remember which approach I adopted. Anyway, eventually where, where it had been in the in-house system that I built and in Embark was that we actually maintained um, two sets of two representations of dimensions. One was a, you know, numeric field per dimension per dimension type. Plate width would have its own little 132 for millimeters or whatever. There'd also be a human readable string that would be effectively a concatenation of that. Um, and I think if I recall, eventually in Embark, I dropped, I was able to do some finicky enough concatenation logic that we eventually dropped the flat free text version of it and it's all built off of the granular stuff. Uh, but that's an example thinking of migration where a um, sort of a strategic deferral of something that is definitely gonna be time intensive um, made sense where sure migrate over the purposely redundant stuff as is because it serves needs that, that can't be met in a more sort of systematically elegant, but time intensive to build up front kind of way, uh, knowing that sometime after it's in the new system that there'll be a time to, to build that out. Um, so, so sort of, you know, di different in their nature, but, but um, um, yeah. So, so let's see. Yeah, so I, uh, yeah, okay, I know where I was here in my, in my notes for this. Um, yeah, so I, I had sort of, in my notes for this, I had sort of two like all cap call outs to things I wanted to think of as like lessons that came to my mind for me about how invisibility plays. So I've got lesson one, invisibility can invisibly steer decisions away from important strategic factors. And I think that the, where that comes from in the story I've just been telling is, is pretty obvious. Um, the invisibility of the very significant amount of time it took for an already on staff person to design, build, and manage an in-house system um, drove an institutional decision unavoidably towards going with an in-house system, um, even though uh, and I never actually did the arithmetic on this, but I am absolutely sure, um, you know, adding up all of the various indirect but definable costs of that approach 
surely that exceeded what would have been paid to, in that case, gallery systems had we moved back, moved to embark back in like 1998 or whenever. Um, but the fact that the the vendor cost would have been highly visible year after year in an operating budget and the cost of the allocated staff time was already bundled and not broken out in any way that that could be made part of that um, case making uh, process um, drove that decision in a direction that while it worked out just fine uh, to my mind was not the most strategic place for it to land right up front um, which also would have avoided a, a, a second uh, migration stage, um, which was by its nature pretty time intensive. So, so that was that was like late '90s. The embark moment got us up to about 2009, 2010. Um, there's obviously 10 years in there, which is a pretty significant amount of time. Broadly speaking, work just kept churning away. You know, there was like data cleaning in the in-house system. There was hmm, how do we make the case for Embark? There was, hmm, how do we improve the website? There was, hmm, how do we make the collection searchable online? Uh, there was, hmm, how do we create more images of collections objects? Um, and in quick sidebar on images, I had started doing direct digital capture uh, back in the 90s using a four by five camera and a digital scan back, a better light back, uh, which, I mean, awesome equipment, made beautiful, beautiful captures, super, super slow and finicky, which was the nature of those things. You know, it would be like a two or three minute exposure. And if, if there was a power hiccup or a bird, well, no, I'd had the windows blacked out. If a bird were in the reapportioned studio and like flew in front of a lamp, you know, it would have been all over. Uh, but, you know, if the floor would vibrate a little bit, there'd be a couple of scan lines that would get glitchy. Um, so um, painstaking, slow, you know, low volume uh, in production for that reason. And uh, it was really useful. Some of those images are still out there. Uh, the Goya Capriccio images that are on the DAC website and downloadable as open access images are better light captures from back in the day. Um, kind of makes me happy. They're, they're still out there living their life in public. Um, but anyway, so all these things were happening. And I, alongside that, and in ways that fed in all sorts of ways into that, I had found it increasingly valuable to become uh, more and more active in MCN, the Museum Computer Network, um, serving in some leadership roles and finding in that organization a muse tech community that you know obviously transcends any one museum because there are people there from all different museums um, and in that way thinking about invisibility within one's own institution uh, in regard at least to um, certain kinds of work um, both mcn and museums and the web now museweb um, have been really central uh, to my career in those ways not just like things that i learned there um, uh, and, and even not just to professional networks of people who, many of whom I now count as friends as well, uh, from those worlds, uh, which is really top of list uh, for me, but also just <laughs> time, time to time feeling like, oh my God, you know, this is, I'm putting all of this effort in and, you know, nobody understands me or, or whatever, you know, wherever we go in our minds with those things. Um, uh, for, for the transcript, I was sort of like, laughing at myself as I said that, uh, but there's some truth there still, which is to say, um, working in a vacuum for an extended period of time, and a vacuum not in regard to, you know, being unappreciated by colleagues or something in a general way, uh, which I, I have always felt, but just in regard to being able to have a more of a nitty gritty conversation with people who um, are similarly engaged with similarly finer points of some pretty technical stuff. Um, and um, all of the human dynamics that happen around that stuff too, the way that that work lives in an institution, the way that conversations about that kind of work or that implicitly rely on that kind of work without necessarily understanding that they do uh, within an institution. Um, those forums have been uh, so important for a sense of community um, that 
I, I, I haven't thought of this until this moment, actually, but, but thinking hypothetically, uh, it have, were there no such a thing as MCN or museums in the web, I bet that I would have uh, at some point or other walked away from this kind of work over the years uh, because it's been a often a, a kind of a mutually nurturing and restorative sort of space to be from time to time and to realize, okay, you know, we're, we're sort of all in this together, each in our way, each in our institution. Uh, and not only can we share some things we've learned with each other, but we can, by having those conversations, come to understand that, that yeah, you know, there, there are a lot of us who are finding a way through these, uh, not just uh, technical things, but the organizational positionings of those technical things um, and the sorts of conversations that can be challenging to um, uh, find ways through that keep that work uh, sufficiently resourced, which is uh, something I'll loop back to a, a little bit further on as well. Um, so I guess in that sense, I had another, this is like lesson 1.5. I wasn't sure it was a whole lesson, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we are sometimes most visible to one another across institutions, and that wider community can be a key resource in keeping us going, um, which is to say we can, in regard to the actual like what is it that we do aspects of things, um, there's less invisibility sometimes when we, um, you know, walk out of our museum and talk with people who are in other museums. Um, so, let's see. Getting back to the narrative thread, I, I said I'm not good at like sticking to a storyline, but I'll, I'll jump back into it now. Um, now we're at 2012 or so, uh, when I did one of the things that actually I, I will admit to taking the most satisfaction in, uh, in, in my time there, which is um, led the development and launch of the DAC open access images policy. Um, and right along with that, prepared and launched uh, the DAC's online collection search in what I called a public alpha. It strictly speaking wasn't really alpha because it was running on a Bark web kiosk, but it was like a highly customized web kiosk that when I launched it, um, there were still a bunch of things I didn't really have working right yet, but I knew that people would still find it useful to be able to more or less search for things and find some things, uh, even if it wasn't uh, <laughs> close to optimized. So did that. Um, and the open access policy was a case um, in which being at a really small museum offered a certain kind of nimbleness. Um, the, the Davison Art Center was able to um, be a pretty early mover and, and by virtue of that make Wesleyan a pretty early mover in making um, images, highly accurate images of public domain objects in the art collection, uh, freely available for any use that people wanted to, to do. Um, there, at that point, in the year or so leading up to that, uh, there had been a, a few high profile uh, launches of similar policies, National Gallery, um, LACMA, um, the Yale Museums, Yale Center for British Art and Yale University Art Gallery. Um, one or two others here and there, but but not a whole lot yet. Uh, clearly, this was a thing that was important. Clearly, it was a thing that, in, in my own little worldview, um, aligned with my sense of why I was doing a lot of the work I was doing um, to make these things as available to people to do whatever they dream up uh, as possible. Um, and since it was such a tiny museum, I mean, three staff people, right? So conversation with, with my boss, conversation with a dean. Dean flew it to provost, I think, if I recall. Um, and there was an approval. You know, I put together a one sheet, one, one, one page PDF um, that laid out why I felt that this move would be aligned with the university's mission, which is, of course, fundamentally educational, um, and um, how it further to that could help position the university as, as a, a leader in that area. Um, and lo and behold, approved, go ahead. So, okay, cool. Uh, we've got an open access images policy now. Uh, in a larger uh, museum with lots of departments, various concerns from various angles. Um, 
you know, all, all of them grounded in experience and legitimate in their way, um, but whether or not I personally would agree with them, um, that would tend to make figuring that out a somewhat longer, slower process. So um, that, that was a case where being in a tiny museum, resource constrained as it was, uh, uh, actually enabled something to happen really quickly. It didn't take huge technical resources. Um, there were ways to, for actual image delivery, uh, largely to leverage existing university infrastructure um, at sort of enterprise scale. You know, there was already a, a content management and delivery platform that I could sort of repurpose for actually delivering the images. Um, since then, they've shifted over to AWS, but um, there was a way to just set up a little one or two line of, of redirect um, in an Apache config file for our main website so we could have stable URLs, which is why people can follow the same links now and get the images from AWS that they used to get via um, a, a CM content management system called Zythos that Wesleyan used to run and has decommissioned since. Um, so there were some, it was ni really nice to be able to make that happen and also some satisfaction in um, having architected it in a way that that actually did survive a couple of major under the hood enterprise uh, architecture changes at Wesleyan uh, right about the time that I moved on from the university without leaving some terrible mess for people to solve. So, phew for that. <laughs> um, and let's see, 2013, I guess 2012, 13, a lot started happening or, or a lot of things that I'd wanted to, to move forward, uh, started getting more traction for, for various reasons. Um, 2013, I was able to start running uh, rapid uh, collections imaging projects um, in some summers. Uh, this was something that as um, digital single lens reflex camera technology improved in the early 2000s, early to mid 2000s, um, the really slow, painstaking, beautiful, better light four by five inch scan back uh, capture that I mentioned uh, was no longer like kind of the only way to do direct digital capture that would really give a really good usable use neutral high res, highly color accurate image. Um, and bubbling up around in the museum imaging uh, world, uh, more and more places were heading towards, uh, for many kinds of capture at least, relatively high volume capture uh, using DSLRs um, and setting up, you know, really consistently lit uh, capture stations and moving as much work as they could in front of the camera and capturing it and having really systematic workflows and empirically assessed quality assessment with color charts and checking delta E's and all of this. So that, that, was, that was fun to get set up. We were in a funny position though, right? Because A, we didn't have enough permanent staff for there to be any way to, to execute on this uh, without hiring in for it. B, we were tiny and we had no track record of ever having done this successfully. C, I don't know how many letters I'm gonna to get to here. C, I have served on enough IMLS grant review uh, panels to know that if I ever saw an application come in from a 2.5 FTE museum saying, we're gonna do this highly accurate systematic collections imaging, and we're gonna pull together a project team and get everybody up and running together and do all this stuff. Uh, and we're gonna aim to get this many thousand images over three summers and whatever. Um, I would have looked at it, I thought, oh man, this is really great. You know, their heart's in the right place. They really wanna do this, but there is no way to know what their chances are for success here. Um, so we knew that trying to get some sort of significant grant right up front would just be <laughs> like not time yet for that. Uh, but happily, there was a really supportive dean at Wesleyan who was able to direct one summer's worth of funding for it to us in 2013. Uh, that was something that really made all the difference because um, I already had the project design sort of roughed out in my head. I was able to build that out more completely. Um, this is where past, past pre-museum life as a photographer and photo lab manager and stuff also kind of helped because I was sort of wired to, to engage with that. And 
uh, was able to hire in a photographer who had significant experience uh, doing um, art imaging, um, had not done the sort of uh, highly consistent um, quantitatively quality control uh, capture that we were gonna do, but he was really eager to learn it. Uh, see you, Kathy. Um, and um, two, two people who I called imaging specialists who were um, largely sort of second stage quality control after the photographer would do quick QC and, you know, metadata embedding and pushing derivatives around and, um, you know, fine rotation and crop and all of that kind of thing. Um, and then two student positions that were basically art handlers, but were really encouraged to learn what was going on in the more technical uh, roles that they were not filling um, in, in their own capacity. Um, and that turned into this like great little team of six of us going crazy for six weeks, shooting as much as we possibly could. I was ironing out that first run, I was ironing out all sorts of like, Okay, well, now we know when we're trying to run network shares and run this number of really big image files across them really fast, um, strange things are happening. Okay, so we'll go to little hard drive arrays and run them up and down the hall and look, it's that's working now. And um, so, you know, some crazy workarounds here and there. Uh, but uh, we shot a whole lot of prints and it came out really well. And then uh, as, as a um, I guess, strictly speaking, secondary kind of value, but <laughs> highly intentional uh, and, and in some ways even more important value than the actual images we made that summer. Uh, we also had a track record to point to. Um, and that then enabled us to um, write um, for uh, IMLS grant support. And we were fortunate to um, funding from the IMLS to run very similar um, projects. Of course, each summer iterating a bit, fine tuning things, but basically adopting the same model for three summers of that. And then um, subsequent to that to um, do so for a second uh, grant as well that funded further imaging. And um, so, you know, after that first, first summer of it in kind of like really scrappy startup mode, um, then we were able uh, to turn that into a recurrent thing. Uh, that said, even with most of the actual uh, work, along with me trying to remove obstacles from people's paths and help them understand what the big aims were and all of this, um, it was still a really um, resource intensive uh, thing for a museum that small to do, right? Um, there was, of course, for the grant, there, there was a matching requirement that we were largely able to do through, you know, shares of people's salaries and, and that who are already being paid and we're putting a lot of time into the project and each in their way. But um, it was it was still something that would uh, tend to displace a lot of other work that typically otherwise would have happened in the summer, uh, because we're running an imaging project again this year, we'd better clear decks um, and um, that kind of thing. So things that, you know, what you know, big inventory projects or, or whatever uh, might not be happening at that same time. Uh, but it was really fun to design and direct those projects. And um, it was also really fun to give some early career folks a chance to get some real world experience uh, doing those kinds of work um, and get something, you know, a, a track record themselves uh, for their resumes. Um, some of the, um, student interns, well, we didn't call them interns, the, the, the student employees, uh, imaging project assistants, um, and the imaging specialists who were outside hires, but really early career people, um, so see them then move on to do other things where, where they were able to leverage some of what they learned uh, then, and, and sort of the reputational value for them too of having been part of one of those projects. Um, so they were, they were always intensive and exhausting and, and mostly fun. Uh, and so let's see. Um, oh yeah, so mentioning project staff, uh, project staff uh, reminds me that I did also want to touch on the invisibility of news tech work and, and permanent staffing levels. Paul, I know you knew this was coming. It's something that I've been thought out loud a little bit in email. Um, 
And this is something I may be careful to craft in a way that doesn't risk misreading in any way uh, before this is published, because um, it, it could risk that. Um, but I think that writ, writ into a single line, um, my, my lesson too is uh, invisibility can pose a serious challenge to appropriately robust staffing. Um, I think is when I tried to, and I may tune this a little bit at the later stage too, but that's the sort of clearest short version I could come up with this morning. Um, and to say a little more about that, um, in my experience, the frequent invisibility of, sorry, just I need to trigger myself with a note here. Uh, the frequent invisibility, <laughs> I'm really not reading it, though I do say, um, of Mustech work to um, internal institutional stakeholders. You know, not so much. I mean, we know it's invisible outside the museum for the most part, unless it's a really socially engaged project of some sort. Um, but that internal invisibility, I think, can really readily lead uh, indirectly to a risk of very fragile understaffing in certain areas. Um, a, one case in point would be um, systems administration uh, for like core collection systems, uh, these, these kinds of things that, um, you know, so long as those systems aren't visibly breaking or, or you know, causing trouble in some way, they can be pretty invisible. I mean, it, in a good sense and a bad sense, they're a little bit like plumbing. You know, if, if they're working, it's great. If they're not, you really know it. Um, but you often don't think about whatever sorts of ongoing maintenance and um, you know, proactive engagement they require that takes uh, very specific kinds of knowledge. Um, so if they're not breaking, it can look like staffing levels are fine, even if they're not. And that's it's, it's like 100% understandable. Um, none of what I'm saying here is like, you know, to, to disrespect or impugn people who don't work in these areas and like, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that anybody should know better or anything like that. It's a, it's a, it's a tough thing to help people understand. Um, and it's, it's something that um, always has been, at least in my experience. Um, but when things are working, um, it can mask the fact that there can still be a dangerous degree of fragility um, in how much the overall uh, pool of people who are our technical staff, if there is a pool or a pool of one or or however many there may be, um, because people don't necessarily have time to cross train in ways that avoid having a single point of failure if one person becomes unavailable. Um, if everybody is maxed out with their primary responsibilities, um, then uh, there's not really a great way to um, ensure that all of the critical things that any one person knows are also known at least to some degree by other folks. So if any one person does become unavailable, then, then you have some sort of smooth failover, even if it's not as well run, as quickly responded to, as smoothly improved as it would be if the person who really lives and breathes that system every day uh, were there. Um, at least there's, there's a reasonable level of predictable continuity, foreseeable continuity uh, across those kinds of transitions. Um, and of course, documentation can help with that. But I think another thing that is can be difficult uh, to help uh, people really get a handle on uh, when they haven't been part of keeping a complex system running um, is that even no matter how solid documentation about that system is, um, losing local technical knowledge that lives in people's heads about how to apply that <laughs> documented knowledge uh, to the way that a system is configured and run. Um, uh, losing that technical knowledge can be really crippling uh, if there isn't a colleague who can just sort of jump in and say, oh yeah, I pretty much know how that works um, and I can help take care of that. Um, and I think there's always, there's always an aim of fostering that kind of cross-training, uh, but it can bump up against um, sort of irreducible capacity constraints, where if somebody is spending enough time <laughs> learning how to be the backup for this invisible thing, then they are not doing things that actually are mission critical that they are the primary person for. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a tough thing, this matter of 
um, you know, <laughs> these human repositories of hands-on operational knowledge, right? And how shared that can be. Um, so much of this um, always comes back to people. I mean, even when we're talking about technologies and news tech and systems and these things, the only way any of this stuff works is when people know how to keep it working and make it work better. Um, and um, that can be, the, the more invisible that is, the tougher it can be to, to, to help people understand why it, it should, should not be, um, uh, you know, le left at a, at a in, in what's actually a dangerous state. Um, or, a, or a fragile state uh, is probably better than dangerous there. <laughs> I, 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 I may amend that one when I'm looking through a transcript. Um, and, and this is true, uh, just to be clear, even this is not about like institutional decision makers, like not understanding things they should or something. I mean, this is, you know, with all of, all of the people in those levels that I've reported to or up to um, in the two museums I've worked in, have been extremely smart people uh, operating in genuinely good faith um, and making what are um, based on uh, what they know, um, the best uh, overall strategic decisions for the institution. Um, the, the super tricky part is um, communicating the importance of keeping invisible work um, happening um, and able to continue happening across any unforeseeable transitions in staff. Um, and, and I have not found a good solution to that. I've, I've had very limited success in uh, moving those um, conversations uh, in the directions that I think would lend the most resilience um, to the operations that I've been part of over the years. Um, it's tricky. I mean, it can, it can look like working properly is just the natural state of those systems uh, when and it can look that, that way very reasonably uh, uh, when in fact um, it's, it's a condition that comes about um, in large part only because of the expertise that staff are applying to those systems every day to keep them running in ways that people don't notice because they are working. Um, and the key other fact there then being, as I mentioned, I mean, that expertise really needs to be shared for operational resilience. Um, and if those systems fail, it's all too easy for that to read as a failure of an individual uh, rather than a structural issue. Um, and by that, I mean, <laughs> systems that complex always fail. I mean, they're not always failing, although in a sort of a philosophical sense, I guess they are. Uh, but in a very practical sense, you know, <laughs> they're always on the edge of failing. You just don't know when they will. You don't know how they will. They will when they do. Um, people need to be able to jump right in and uh, make them work again the way that they're supposed to work. And if that's being covered adequately um, by even just one person, then it's easy for it to seem like the natural state of that system is that it just works. So great, you know, so be it. Um, and it's, it's just a catch 22 in that way, right? You know, if it's if it's working, then it must be fine that it's working with the staffing level that we have. If it's not working, then it's a why is it not working? It needs to work, and that's a very reasonable response. Again, I'm not judging that response, um, but there's a the the key piece of it around the invisibility of the ongoing work that it takes to keep the thing already working in a way that makes it seem to be its natural state. Um, that's a tough one. So people, 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 it's, I mean, these are technologies, but it's, it's people. And, um, you know, that all of, all of that was by way of example, focused on systems. I'm thinking here of things like collection systems, uh, obviously it would be sort of top of list for that. Um, but I think it also applies in all sorts of ways to other technology, digital, digital technologies work in museums. And of course, for that matter, probably all work in museums and most work anywhere is that ultimately whatever sorts of technologies are in play, whatever sorts of um, platforms and systems and tools and software are, are in play, it's ultimately people who make these things work, who keep them working for other people who, um, 
answer a technical support email to help the people who usually make them work figure it out when they can't figure out what the issue is. Um, and all of that can be um, so invisible in ways that um, can pose um, continuing risks that can be difficult to communicate. Um, that I don't know. I, I guess I keep coming back to the risk mitigation thing, which is not necessarily the most zingy, engaging sort of thing, but it's where my mind has been a lot in recent years. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, I think it's the reason it's surfacing so much in these comments is because to my mind, it is so closely bound up with the framing rubric of invisibility. Uh, the less visible something is, um, and by something here, I guess I really mean the less visible the particular kinds of expert work that can, can be required um, are, um, the more they are at risk of um, laying the groundwork for um, <laughs> difficulties that could otherwise have been prevented, let me put it that way. So, and I guess to, to since there's there has been an occasional shred of narrative in this, let me like get back to that to like tie it. I know we're over time, um, but is so so I I was at the Davis Art Center for 25 years. Um, I had in the later years of that run come to realize, my gosh, I've been here for more than 20 years. Um, everything I know leads me to think that statistically I am likely to see through my career here because people tend not to leave a place after a couple of decades if they've been there that long. Um, and then to my surprise, um, certain things changed, um, certain opportunities popped up, and um, it just proved to be time now about two years ago um, to look into a new possibility, uh, which did pan out. And I have um, since 2019 been the head of IT at the Yale Center for British Art, uh, which surely is another reason why so much of what I've ended up thinking out loud about here um, has been systems related. Uh, because while my former job at the Davis and Art Center covered a pretty wide range of areas, including imaging and uh, data content itself and, and a lot of other things as well as systems. Um, my current role is more specifically focused on infrastructure of various sorts for the most part. Um, so that, that tends to be more front of mind more of the time for me, although <laughs> I've always spent a lot of time obsessing about that sort of thing. So, um, and um, I may as well say, since we're like 99% of the way through a big curve, that I will actually be retiring June 30th. Um, and uh, still, I'm probably an MCN member for life. It would surprise me if I were not. Um, and I'll be seeing through a couple of um, professional service roles with AAM and with MCN for another year after that. But um, I will be, I guess, no longer a fully employed active muse tech professional, but maybe I'll make room in this field in which uh, many people are eager to work. Um, if, if, if all things remain equal in the structural sense uh, of, of this, um, who knows, maybe there will be a great opening for, for somebody else to engage with. <laughs>